Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so it's weird on Zoom not knowing how many everybody is, but it's really nice uh, to be in a position of introducing the second session uh, of American Ar Archives in Britain. Uh, this is a series of talks that are the culmination of a project looking at very literally our archives, American, Ar American Ar archives uh, that we might be able to locate without crossing the Atlantic and find here in the in the UK. Um, it's a project that was uh, initiated and uh, supported by the Terra Foundation for American Art and has run through the Centre for American Art at the Courtauld Institute. Um, if you were able to join us yesterday, you will have heard Karen DeFranco uh, give a really fantastic um, paper that was really looking at Carolee Schneeman and uh, the Bojess Press uh, work in the 1970s that asked us to think some really interesting questions about, for example, the relation to the boundary or border, if there is one, between art and archive. And we heard Michael Leisure give a really uh, illuminating keynote paper, Problems um, of Primariness, in which he explored ideas emerging out of the book project, Art of the United States, 1752-2000 Primary Sources. Uh, and Michael gave us some really provocative terms and ways of thinking about archives that hopefully we can pick up over the course of the day. You also heard me talk, go on a bit about um, applications to the uh, V&A Art Fund during the 1970s. <laughs> Less profundity there, perhaps. Um, today, we have three papers, um, all coming out of the case studies that we've developed uh, for this project, um, followed by a question and answer session, which should take us through to about 4.30. We'll have a short break after that, and then we'll be really reconvening at 4.50 for a roundtable discussion involving everybody that's been involved across the two days, uh, chaired by uh, Professor David Peters Corbett. Um, I was a bit disappointed yesterday that no one in the chat uh, or questions picked up on my provocative reference to narrow-minded art historians produced by the Courtauld Institute, but maybe the, the roundtable will be an opportunity to get back into that. Um, we will, I think it makes most sense to, to, to get going with the, the three papers today. We're going to be hearing from Mark Rollins and Ashley Gallant speaking together, followed by um, uh, Lucy Bradnock. And I'll introduce the, each of those speakers in more detail in turn. Uh, and then we'll be we'll have the opportunity um, to, to, to come back for, um, for, for questions. So if you're thinking about questions for any or all of the speakers, do make notes. Um, and start writing in the chat. You can do that at the end of the, the talks um, or at any point along the way. I've just seen that uh, David did make note of my uh, narrow-minded art historian's comment. <laughs> so we'll see if that, that resurfaces or not. I'm, I'm sure it won't. Um, okay, so uh, next up we have a collective um, undertaking, a, a paper titled uh, Orphaned Images, Photographs Without Their Photo Books. Um, this is a collaboration between Mark Rawlinson uh, and Ashley Gallant. Um, Mark is uh, Mark Rawlinson uh, works at the University of Nottingham, uh, where his current research explores the minor histories of post-war American photography and relates to the renaissance of the medium in the US during the 1970s, a renaissance whose origins can be traced back to the GI Bill and the photography teaching programs of the 1950s onwards. He argues that minor histories more usefully account for the divergent, experimental, and often incoherent forms of practice that are the predominant focus of this project. By minor histories, he does not mean qualitatively less important or overlooked. Many of the few um, photographers and curators of interest are not obscure or unknown. However, the dominant interpretive discourse of photography, its major history, has reduced many to the realm of historical context. Uh, if you were tuning in hoping to hear Mark's dulcet Mancunian tones, you'll be disappointed, but otherwise I'm sure um, there's been no further disappointment in the fact that it's Ashley Gallant who's going to be giving the paper today um, and speaking to us on Zoom. Ashley is um, at the University of Nottingham and um, Sheffield Museums. He's a curator and PhD candidate. As a curator, he cares for the Ruskin Collection, a teaching collection including 19th century books of prints, drawings and early photography. His PhD research focuses on the intersection of copyright law and the museum. Arguing that museum collections should be copyright free to encourage use and that a form of object and property based copyright thinking has become the dominant curatorial mode thought method. He argues that by challenging this, we can publicly own and use more diverse and experimental forms of art practice. 
the paper um, has been a collaboration between um, Mark and Ashley and relates also to an exhibition that the, they will be co-curating called Format Shift. So uh, without further ado, hand it over to Ashley for orphaned images, photographs without their photo books. Okay, so I wanted to start this presentation with a little bit of background, which uh, John's already kind of done. So I'm currently undertaking my PhD in art history, looking at how copyright has affected museum collections. And part of this research considers how ownership and objecthood within copyright has kind of sh shaped what we accept as art or what we believe is art. Um, I undertook this specific research alongside Dr. Mark Rollinson, who's a photography specialist and is currently undertaking a project, Minor Histories, which has uh, just been discussed. Mark had previously written a book on Ed Roche that presented how Roche's photo books had been appropriated by hundreds of other artists. And I'd recently seen the display of the Roche, Roche books at Tate and was thinking about copyright and photo books within my PhD research. This all meant that Mark and I had been discussing the role of the photo, the photographic print and the image as kind of three separate entities and the photo book, which holds them a lot. And it was through these conversations this project started. We were both interested in how Roche's images had left the book format. So by this, I mean that as well as owning original Ed Roche books, many museums, including the Tate, also own physical prints of single images which are taken from these books. Interestingly, these prints were printed years after the original images in the book form, uh, and the prints were bought into the collection separately from the books, sometimes decades later. So for instance, in 8900 Sunset Boulevard, which is from 1966, a single image is reprinted in 2014 and enters the Tate collection as a print in 2015, alongside another print taken from the 1966 book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip. This happens again with the 1963 book, 26 gasoline stations, and its later print, Standard Figure Rower, 1962, gets reprinted in 2012, and Standard Beverly Boulevard, 1962, is also printed in 2012. Interestingly, the Tate website lacks images for these two later prints because they, I find that kind of interesting because they already own the identical image within the collection, within the book. So it's odd that those images aren't available on the website. Um, I also find it odd, odd with my kind of curator head on that um, they own 26 gasoline stations as a book and as a print of a drawing of the book and a photo of a hand holding the book and single images from part of the book as prints. So it's kind of functioning in this like really odd fragmented way within the collection. This got me to wondering what's really going on here and kind of why is the singular photo book not enough? Why must we remove images from these books or in Roche's case kind of keep, keep replicating the images um, and put them on the wall? Are the images on the wall more important than those in the books? Are they more kind of art in a way? And where does this place the book in the museum structure? How do we view these three concepts, the image, the image in the book, and the image as photographic print? And what, ha what happens when these images become orphaned from their books? What's more, when these images uh, do become orphaned from their books, uh, why only collect a few images from each book? When the selection of prints is nowhere near enough to give an understanding of the book, which utilizes repetition and show a number of images to hammer home its point about the mundane architecture of the American West. Why would you take apart a book which seems to be a curated entity, a sealed object within itself, which exists in its own entirety, and remove singular images from it and place them on the wall? So with these questions, I access the Tate archive and exhibition histories to see how these works are displayed and to dis see if these display methods could provide us any answers to these questions. So firstly, I found out that Tate owns not one, but four copies of 26 gasoline stations, a first, second, and two third editions, all of which are part of the artist's book collection. This is unusual in itself. If the book is treated like other multiples, such as prints on paper, such as screen prints, then the museum would very rarely own more than one version of an edition to print. By placing the work in the artist's book collection, the Tate indicates to us that it is treating these books as art objects in their own right more similar to a screen print or another multiple than a traditional book. Accordingly, Roche's books are displayed in glass vitrines alongside wall-based prints in the Roche artist's room display that I'd recently seen. But, and this is interesting, when I researched the provenance of the books, the Tate stated that the first edition came in with the Martin Parr collection, which is a collection of photo books purchased from the photographer, and that actually only in the past five years had photo books been collected. Until that point, the library would purchase them out of their own budget, 
often not even realizing they were photo books at all, and only then would the books be classified in, either into the main library or the artist book collection. I find this telling that historically the collection of photo books is a library matter, whereas if the books are seen as artist books, then they seem to become a curatorial matter. Does this point to a differentiation between the high budget, high print run photo book and the lower print run work of someone like Roche? Where does the line between the photo book in the library and the artist book containing photos in the artist book collection fall? To further complicate the issue, the singular prints from the book 26 Kathleen stations that are individual photographic objects, or in our words, orphaned images, sit under the prints and drawings department, meaning that an identical photographic image of a gasoline station can reside in three different institutional silos, the library, the artist book collection, and the print collection. Through the lens of my own specific interest in copyright, these different iterations of the image created at different times also frustrate the role of the museum as a public collection, because by its nature, copyright is attributed when the image is produced. So does this mean that the image in book form and the images in print form will obtain different lengths of copyright protection and therefore enter the public domain at different points in history? And how do we choose which one to attribute image rights to for academics and publishers when the images are identical? And does it matter? Could the institution keep works under protection and retain control for longer in this way? Does a reproduction of the gasoline station image when taken from the source of the original book versus taken from a singular photographic print as its source means something different when used to illustrate an academic text. This repetition of a single image in multiple artworks and locations within one institution creates many sticky issues, but that's kind of a small digression. This initial information from the archive leads us on to our next question. How does the relationship between the book and the print play out when the images are displayed? Looking at the exhibition archive at Tate, we were able to locate that the gallery labels do mention that the Roche books were produced before the photographic prints. Quote, only later did he present them as prints to be displayed on the wall, end quote. The label also stated that the book format allows Roche, quote, full control over the sequence of images. Sometimes these books use blank pages and surprising pairings like the dramatic timing and punchline of a joke, end quote. The importance of sequencing is clearly understood as the books are digitized and presented on digital touchscreens to allow the audience to experience the sequencing and the books in their entirety. So this provides us with one point of difference between the book and the prints, the sequence in which they are shown. Obviously, as Tate only have a few prints from the entire book, the display of these prints lack any sequencing. Although in their own labels, they have stated the importance of this for Rochelle's practice and the entirety of the work. This raises even more questions about the role of sequencing and how curators might inadvertently reorder and thus reauthor the images when images become orphaned from their photo books. This led us to look at other institutions and display archives where images from photo books have been displayed on prints as, wall, on, as prints on the wall to look at the role of sequencing here to see if orphaned images sequencing is always treated in a similar manner across different museums. Firstly, the Graves Gallery as part of Sheffield Museums, where the complete series of new industrial parks by Lewis Boltz was displayed. In this instance, the sequencing was dictated by the artist through the private collection and mimics the sequencing of the book of the same title. The display for all intents and purposes was a wall-based version of the book. In this instance, the book was not mentioned in the interpretation at all. The in-gallery labels focusing on the body of work's importance in relation to the new topographic movement and new American landscape photography, somewhat overlooking the importance the book form took within this historic practice. So far, we have a mixed picture of how to handle photographic books and their images. At Tate, the photo book sits in between institutional collections and departments, but is referenced clearly when the prints from the books are displayed. Whereas in Sheffield, the photo book as source is ignored in the interpretation completely with more importance being placed on the historic impact of the images. Even though this display was dictated by the book sequence and far closer to the original source book, its display method showed every image from the book in its entirety. So we're starting to build up a rather blurred picture, if you'll excuse the pun, or of multiple approaches to the photo book in both collection and display. So next, we wanted to look at two more contemporary examples to see if this would help us tie down these issues and how they play out in the photo book today. So for this paper, we looked at John Rathman and Mishka Henner, both artists who've made work in relation to and inspired by Ed Roche. Firstly, Rathman with his work 16 Google Street Freeze from 2009. In this case, the images are first of all seen in a digital book, 
but when printed can be shown in any sequence at all, or as in the case when displayed at the collection at Usher Gallery in Lincoln, shown individually completely removed from the book sequencing. In this case, the book acts as less of a traditional book and more of a digital catalogue, which is shared with curators as a PDF before the exhibition. The museum is then allowed to choose which images are printed and be displayed. As more works are printed, they are recorded by the commercial gallery to create the correct number of editions, but the works are only produced on demand as they are, need, as they are needed by curators, meaning that the edition is somewhat theoretical and only physicalized into an object when needed. What's more, the publication as PDF also challenges the photo book's relationship to physicality and sequencing by being shareable, viewable and printable at will and natively digital outside of any form of edition. In Raffman's case, the photo book is literally just a repository for images before they become physicalized. Unlike Roche, where the production of prints would seem to be an afterthought years after the fact, and the books numbered in addition, and the books were numbered and editioned as individual objects to begin with. If Roche's images are orphaned from their books by being printed, in Raffman's case, the images are waiting to be printed with the book acting as a mere storage location. Next, we looked at British artist Miska Henner in his work, 51 Military Outposts, which Henner made in response to being asked to take part in an exhibition directly working in relation to the work of Ed Roche. Henner describes making artist books before he knew what an artist book was. And once he discovered Roche and the genre, he started to think of the artist book as a potentially new way of conceiving how a photo project might look or how photos might exist in the world. In making 51 Military Outposts, Henner wanted to quote, Think about Roche's 26 gasoline stations and consider if you made that today with this technology available, what would you make? What could you make? End quote. Henner also liked the fact that in Roche's parking lots, he handed over the photography to an aerial photographer. It wasn't the artist producing the images, a technique mirrored in the use of images from automated Google Earth pictures in Henner's own work, which he describes as a beautiful parallel. What's interesting for us in Henner's work is that almost all of his artist books and he is very clear these are artist books, not photo books, a print on demand. These works are made by, as open editions, available to anyone at a reasonable price, and as such have since entered the V&A Art Library amongst others, and become institutionalized as photo books. In my eyes, Henner's own defining of the works as artist books challenge our preconceived notion of the artist book as something which is handmade and unique, more akin to a sculpture. Because Henner's artist books are print on demand, non-editioned and domestically priced, they go against all the tropes of the unique art object. I wanted to explore this more, so I set up a meeting at Henna's studio. And through a fascinating and wide range of conversation, a few key points came out. Henna described the photo book as being glossy and expensive to put together, something designed and produced by a publishing house, as opposed to the more DIY artist book and description he uses for his own work. He described the process of creating prints from these on-demand books as led by the needed display, i.e. curators and institutions asked for images from the books to be printed. He only had the images at publishing quality and making printable larger versions was actually an extra piece of work for him. He was actually, in, or for all intents and purposes, creating a new piece of work. This demonstrates the artists had always intended them to be seen in the book form, and it was the need for physical institutional display which pushed them into singular print formats, or as we would put it, orphaned them. Again, we see a different approach, whereas Raffman always expects the images to become wall-based, and Roche has negatives as sources to produce new prints from. Henner, in only ever seeing the image within the book, did not even have a file available to produce a, last wall, a large wall-based print until asked, having to go back and retroactively create the works for wall display. But in all three cases, this raises the question of why the book in themselves, which are seen by the artists as the artworks incomplete, uh, as complete artworks, are not displayed in exhibitions, but wall-based images are almost always required. Henry and I also discussed the availability of images online and how this might draw a relationship with the history of American landscape photography. Many artists working with Google Earth today work with images of America, not only for political and artistic reasons, but also because the USA is the most accessible and widely photographed geographic location of that platform. The availability of images of America versus, say, Russia, is understood to be purposeful on the part of the American state and big business. Because if you share images you've produced, you then own those images that people can see clearly in the environment around them, a certain inquisitiveness is removed. 
i.e. people don't go looking if everything's handed over already. Although this brings up fascinating issues of the trustworthiness of these images and other links to images of the American landscape related to government projects historically, for this paper, the main question both Henner's and Raffman's work brings up is if this te new technology, its specific focus on abundance of American images, creates or extends a particularly American history of landscape image making. These ideas led to a further discussion about the difference between the artist book versus the photo book. I put forward that the difference between the handling of these two types of books and the need to produce prints might be purely based on the institutional need for display. For instance, do the images in the photo book more easily leave the book format to be displayed on the wall and resequenced, whereas the artist book is treated as, as an art object complete within itself, a sculpture to be displayed? Is the key difference the exhibitionness of the images in the photo book and that ease of resequencing? And does the museum's need for the protection of the original object create the artist book as object? By which I mean, if we let people flick through artist books, they would be destroyed. So is the display, artist books and photo books more generally, inherently difficult and in opposition to the museum's aims for protecting the object in perpetuity? Does this museological need for protection of the book cause the orphaning of images uh, from their original book locations by forcing them on into more easily displayable and sturdy wall-based prints? So I feel I should probably point out here that Mishka disagreed with me on many of these points and felt these taxonomic definitions were institutional concerns, not overly considered by the artist when they were making the works in the first place. Although on going back to Tate to ask them how they made their decisions, the artist's intention again becomes paramount in the eyes of the institution. Quote, the decision on what we consider an artist's book and what was considered main collection usually depends on the artistic intention. For example, an artist working with the form of the book as a work of art, or if the artist has been involved in the design of the book. Uh, some artist books are in the Martin Parr collection. This is a primarily a photo book collection, but includes some things which we would have classed as exhibition catalogues. We also have photo books in the artist book collection. Sometimes it's not always clear whether something is an artist book or not. Because the photo book is an artist slash photographer engaging with the format conceptually, these were added to the artist books collection. Zines were also filed with artist books, but there was a project a few years ago to separate these out and create a sequence for zines distinct from the artist books." End quote. So it feels like the Tate, as we haven't quite got our handle on it. So I think that from that statement, it's clear to me these definitions between artist books and photo books and artist books that contain photographs are still full of kind of fluid boundaries and are still causing a lot of issues for institutions. But Tate's attempt at a definition still leaves us with thorny issues, such as does the separation of photo books from photographers working with the book format hinder in the eyes of the Tate and the wider art community? These high production cost, high print run photo books are not carefully sequenced by the artist or are somehow not conceptual. Can expensive glossy photo books not be as conceptual as DIY handmade ones? And if we go down that line of thinking, when does a photo book become an artist book? How conceptual or how involved does the artist need to be? Another key interest for me in, uh, is that sequencing is also protected as a creative act under copyright. So how does the display of a single page or a series of individually orphaned images from a sequenced book disrupt, disrupt the artist's rights? Can we and should we curate images from a sequenced book? Or by the fact that they are sequenced, should they always be kept as a whole? As we see Rafmet, with Rathbun, the production of printed images can be carefully planned by the maker as part of the concept of the relationship between image and artist and book. Or, uh, sorry, I've lost what I'm saying there. Uh, or can the, uh, where he, so Rathbun imagines the print production as purely an outcome of curators needed to display images. Uh, sequencing can be sidestepped by the institution or as with the uh, bolts, the sequencing is inherent in the rules of the display. So basically we've kind of like loads more questions from the research we've done. So this has led us to where we are now with some information from the kind of exhibition histories and archives on how the image in the photo book has been treated across a few institutions and a whole new set of questions. So at the moment we're now again going back to ask us ourselves, what is the difference between the photo book and the artist book? and how is this handled institutionally and to what extent do institutions need for the display and care for the object 
and the inability for the viewer to handle the work in the original book dictate how we consider the artist's book and photo book in the museum. So we're asking if by the fact that museums have to care for the object, it's stopping us books functioning in the correct way. And we're also really interested in how often these individual prints exist because the curators have asked for them to be produced and the artists never thought about that. Um, so as was mentioned, Mark and I are now working on an exhibition project for 2024. And hopefully some of these questions will play out within those display methods in the exhibition project because we'll be working on the back of Mark's Ed Roche book and working with artists who make artist book inspired by Roche. Cool. Thank you. That's great, Ashley. Thank you um, for that. We're going to come to questions along the way, but um, you've asked us an awful lot of questions there, so it might be that people will be answering or answering questions with more questions. Uh, we'll see how we get to there. We have a third um, paper today, which is also um, came out of a, a um, practice of, of collaborative work um, between. I think Mark had some involvement in in this project. Um, but uh, as did uh, Catherine Doniak at um, Nottingham Trent University. Uh, but I think the, the sp our speaker today who's going to be talking about this case study is Lucy Bradnock um, from University of Nottingham, who is Associate Professor of Art History and incoming editor of the journal Art History. She is author of No More Masterpieces, Modern Art After a Toad. Um, I'll pronounce that really badly, <laughs> from Yale, Yale University Press 2021 and co-editor of Lawrence Alloway, Critic and Curator, um, published by the Getty in 2015, and Pacific Standard Time, Los Angeles Art 1945 to 1980, also Getty, um, 2011. Her writing has also appeared in Art History, Oxford Art Journal, Art Journal, and the Journal of the Archives of American Art, and in collect uh, and catalogues uh, for the exhibition Spectres of Art Old, uh, still doing that badly. Um, language and the Arts, um, circa 1952. Um, Mark Dion, Misadventures of 21st Century Naturalist, uh, Delirious Art at the Limits of Reason, 1950 to 1980, and Light and Space. Her new research explores eco-critical art histories of regionalism and, public, uh, and art publics in the American Midwest. And the paper today is titled Abstract Impressionism, in the East Midlands. Thanks so much, John. And I should say my paper today is about none of those um, things that you just listed. Great. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And also uh, for the other papers that we've heard today, um, I think it's such a, uh, there are some really nice resonances that are kind of coming through those papers to do with um, scale and fragmentation, to do with the materiality of the archive. Um, and I'm hoping that that what I talk about today, the project that I that I outline, will touch on, on some of those questions also. Um, forgive me, I'm just starting my uh, stopwatch. Um, I also want to talk about a uh, the kind of question of, of what happens to archival research in the context of a global pandemic, um, what happens when our focus and our direction and our scale shift, um, and when our study of American art starts much closer to home. So my paper today is called Abstract Impressionism in the East Midlands, and I'm talking to you from my office at the University of Nottingham. Um, as John outlined, this is really collaborative research. So this is research that I've been undertaking um, with Catherine Doniak, and Kat is in the audience today. Um, so I do want to, to give her credit for lots of the research that I'll be presenting today. Um, any inelegant prose is entirely my fault, um, so don't blame her for that. Okay. Um, oh. On the 25th of November, 1957, the British painter Harold Cohen wrote to Lawrence Alloway, then assistant director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, to outline plans for an exhibition at the University of Nottingham, where Cohen was a visiting fellow in the Department of Fine Art. The exhibition timed to coincide with a small showing of French Impressionist painting from the collection of Lord Radcliffe, was aimed at tracking similar artistic impulses in contemporary abstract painting. 
Deploying in his letter what he thought was Alloway's own term, abstract impressionism, Cohen was writing with a double request for advice. First, about which painters ought to be included under that moniker, abstract impressionism. And second, and I'm quoting from him here, where we could get hold of some pictures for, say, four weeks in the spring. The informal and pretty last minute nature of this curatorial approach notwithstanding, the communication would prove fortuitous since Alloway was rapidly brought on board as co-curator of the exhibition, which opened as planned on the 19th of February, 1958 and ran for a month before traveling from Nottingham to the Arts Council Gallery Cambridge, the Lang Art Gallery Newcastle and the Arts Council Gallery in London. Abstract Impressionism comprised 26 paintings by British, American and European artists, united, according to Alloway, by their common deployment of abstract forms, as well as an interest in the play of light rendered by means of what Alloway termed in the exhibition catalogue, the use of conspicuous paint. These, the exhibition, aligned by virtue of their placement in an adjacent gallery to the 19th century Impressionist paintings. I don't want to spend a long time today thinking through uh, how convincing Alloway's uh, designation and description of these paintings was, and really my emphasis is on the kind of mechanics and networks by which uh, the exhibition came to pass. A critic in the Manchester Guardian who viewed the exhibition at Nottingham was unconvinced by Alloway's rationale, professing a lack of clarity on whether Alloway had intended the term abstract impressionism as a straightforward replacement for the more common designations abstract expressionism, action painting or tachisme, or whether he was proposing a new category entirely. Suffice it to say, I think that Alloway was probably trying to find a category that didn't have such clear national associations, one that could kind of transcend those different contexts of the UK, Europe and the United States. The Guardian critic was not alone in rejecting the term abstract impressionism. Alloway's term gained very little traction and the exhibition often remains a footnote in histories of abstract painting in the UK and the US which is not to say it's ignored entirely, but it's very rarely unpacked and examined. Yet abstract expressionism, and I'm showing you an installation photograph of the exhibition here on the right hand side. This is scanned from uh, the only installation uh, photograph slide that we have in the university slide collection, which is housed in something that's now called the Digital Transformations Hub in the Humanities Building on University Park Campus. So here are those um, slide drawers on the left-hand side. These are actually Nottingham's slide drawers on the left. Um, abstract Impressionism then was not necessarily an exhibition that kind of changed uh, the way in which people spoke about abstract painting in the UK or the US, but it did remain a significant showing of contemporary art, American art in the UK and specifically in the East Midlands. It thus, I think, has something to tell us about the way in which American painting was being framed here and the professional and personal networks that facilitated and shaped this framing and that extended beyond London to sites that are also often left out of existing art histories. As Hannah Neat has articulated in her really fantastic account of the Midland Group Gallery, which opened in Nottingham in 1961, regional geographies are crucial in understanding UK art worlds as shaped concurrently by provincial and metropolitan agents and by the interaction between the two, a point that extends to those that exhibited and thus publicly staged modern American art. As a case study, abstract impressionism also sheds light on the role of campus galleries as another type of what Lisa Tickner has persuasively called, and I'm quoting Tickner here, nodal points in the systems of exchange between artists, dealers, critics, curators and collectors, or as sites and catalysts for the translation and consolidation of economic and cultural capital." End quote. But the works included in abstract impressionism were for sale and archival materials include price lists. 
suggests that the university gallery was positioned on this occasion at least at the intersection of the commercial and academic spheres. But the exhibition was also shaped, enabled and underwritten by national and international agendas, including those of the Arts Council and the United States Embassy, the former on the brink of an expanded support of the Midlands as a regional cultural hub, and the latter keen to pr promote American culture abroad. Indeed, abstract impressionism is one part of a larger American cultural initiative that is also evident, uh, for example, in the Museum of Modern Art's year-long touring exhibition, The New American Painting, which traveled to eight European countries in 1958-59. So that opened just a few months after abstract impressionism. The New American Painting arrived in London at the Tate Gallery on the 24th of February, 1959, just a year, just over a year after the Nottingham exhibition had opened. The American Embassy's willingness to lend works to Alloway seems to indicate that reaching a European audience was of both concern and interest. And the timeline of uh, American Arts exhibition in the UK that was carried out by the Tate Project Refiguring American Art articulates that strategy really, really clearly. On one level then, our research has been aimed at, at disentangling these threads to understand how abstract impressionism came to be and what it represented in these various contexts and for its different stakeholders, both individual and institutional. So the aim of this project really has been threefold. At local level, we've aimed to surface lost institutional histories. Um, and that task has revealed the frailty of institutional record keeping and the impact on the archival body, so to speak, of organizational shifts. So the University of Nottingham Gallery moved uh, from its Portland building location where this exhibition was to a new art center in 1992. And the university no longer has a fine art department, the department that Cohen um, was part of. Um, when we planned this research, we envisaged the Nottingham part of the research to be really easy uh, and take, you know, a few hours uh, or half a day at most. I envisaged, you know, that all of this stuff would be in the university manuscripts and special collections. And what really quickly became apparent was that that, that was not the case, that those institutional shifts had brought about um, the kind of dispersal and sometimes disappearance of the institutional archival record. As the project unfolded, it's then developed a more practical aim alongside one that's kind of directed towards exhibition histories and historiography, um, which is to ensure the security of the archival record such that a really tangible outcome of this research that we've been doing has been the transfer of materials to the university manuscripts and special collections. So as we came across materials um, in uh, less than archival conditions, um, we kind of facilitated the transfer of those um, to proper holdings. On a national scale, we've been exploring regional links and networks that are crucial to the reception of uh, American art. And in thinking through the international context of abstract impressionism, we've aimed to more fully understand how and by whom American abstract art was positioned in relation to British and European painting. The network of relationships and roles brought to bear during the short period of the exhibition's organization are elucidated by an archival cache of some three dozen letters in the university's collection, which we located in the bottom of an overlooked filing cabinet in a staff office next to a display case of plastic dinosaurs left over from the gallery shop. Correspondence represented in uh, those letters include Alistair Smart, professor and head of the Department of Fine Art at the University and director of the University Gallery, as well as the departmental secretary, Brenda Gotts, and the University Finance Officer, A.A. A. Hendry. There's substantial correspondence with staff at the Arts Council, which coordinated the transport of the British paintings from London to Nottingham and provided financial underwriting for the exhibition, as well as host venues as it traveled to Cambridge and London. Philip James, Arts Council director from 1942 to 1948, and Hugh Shaw, his deputy, proved particularly supportive in these respects. In relation to the British paintings, particularly, Cohen and Alloway communicated with several of the artists, including Richard Smith, who designed the exhibition catalogue on the left, and his work was also included in the exhibition This Is No Place 
in the center, uh, which you can see um, in that image on the right hand side. No Place was actually exhibited uh, kind of in one piece in abstract impressionism, but later cut in half um, by the artist. So that's what we see in the center. They also corresponded with those artists' London galleries, most notably keeping in regular contact with Peter Gimple at the London Gallery Gimple Feast. And this is him in that central image there, which represented Cohen and most of the other British artists involved in the exhibition and had also staged a showing of Sam Francis oils and watercolours the previous year. The catalogue to that exhibition had included an essay by the influential art critic Herbert Reed, whom Smart invited to formally open the Nottingham exhibit while lamenting that, and I'm quoting uh, the letter on the left-hand side, the melancholy decision of the university grant committee has left me with no opportunity to offer a fee. Despite plans for what's described in other correspondence as a decent sherry party, it seems that Reed was unable or perhaps unwilling to make the journey. And the exhibition was opened instead by Philip James on behalf of the Arts Council. For the purposes of this project with its remit to explore American art in UK archives, the most significant correspondence is a set of letters between Alloway and Stefan Munsing, the cultural affairs officer at the US Embassy in London, who assisted in securing the American paintings for display at Nottingham. And you can see Munsing's uh, name about a third of the way down the guest list on the right hand side, just below staff from the Arts Council and Anthony Blunt of the Courtauld Institute. Munsing, who had served at the London Embassy since 1955, was well versed in international cultural diplomacy, as well as in exhibition curation and design. As a so-called monuments man, he'd headed up the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section of the Office of Military Government for Bavaria, supervising cultural restitution operations at the central collecting point in Munich. He also established the State Department's America House programs, commonly known as the US Information Center in Munich and Berlin, and he organized several high profile exhibitions and cultural programs in Germany and Austria. In his capacity as State Department diplomat based at the London Embassy and, and their Grosvenor Square Embassy was kind of under construction um, at, uh, at the point that um, uh, abstract impressionism uh, was being uh, organized. Um, Munzing's involvement in the abstract impressionism exhibition was focused on securing the American paintings by lenders, including the Martha Jackson, Bertha Schaefer, um, Perido and stable galleries in New York, um, and also supporting the logistics of the paintings transport to Nottingham. So those were all uh, kind of brought up from London together. The increasingly frantic tone of correspondence in the archives indicates that the arrival of the American pictures was in jeopardy until the very last minute, even as arrangements were made for the opening reception. That their inclusion was crucial to the premise and success of the show, and that their ultimate arrival was considered a great coup by curators, university officials and critics alike is clear. The presence of the American paintings in Nottingham brought several benefits, both to the individual curators and also to the university. Abstract Impressionism predated Alloway's first visit to the United States, which he undertook from mid-April until mid-June of that same year, 1958, sponsored by the US State Department's Foreign Leaders Program, which operated as a form of cultural diplomacy and bringing key foreign cultural figures to the United States. But as this correspondence makes clear, he'd already, or he already had um, established working relationships with one of the State Department's key cultural figures, and it was Munzing's support and guidance, Nigel Whiteley has proposed, that, Alloway would, um, that would secure Alloway the prestigious grant to go to the United States for the first time. For Cohen and the other British artists included in the exhibition, the American paintings brought critical attention from which they could benefit by proxy. Universally, critics identified Sam Francis's work as the most impressive and the most significant in the show, though several also mentioned Cohen's own work, Happy Day, favorably in their reviews. Undergraduate student, Gerald Needham, writing in the university's student newspaper, The Gongster, singles out the Francis alongside works by Norman Bloom and a painter he calls Joan Miller, presumably an intended reference to Joan Mitchell, whose painting Hudson River Dayline was included in the exhibition. Of the Francis, Needham observes that, and I'm quoting here, 
The most striking picture is by an American, Sam Francis. It is a huge 14 foot long canvas which occupies one end wall. Francis's other work entirely in white and the blue painting next to it by another American painter, Norman Bloom, are of the kind that arouses derision in people unfamiliar with abstract paintings. An examination reveals, however, that there is tremendous subtlety in their use of different shades and of the same color of a definite, if unobtrusive form. His discussion of the European works and those by uh, the young Englishman uh, Bernard Cohen and Peter Kinley is far briefer, motivated by uh, perhaps by economies of space and also the needs of a readership uninitiated in the complexities of abstract painting. Needham assures the university community of the excellence of Cohen's and Kinley's contributions, those UK painters, by pointing to their inclusion alongside works uh, by their better known American contemporaries. For Needham, the presence of these American paintings functions as the exhibition's mark of quality for, as he reminds the reader, it has been in America that many important developments in modern art have taken place. What even this student review suggests, therefore, um, is that the American pictures offered authority and legitimacy to their lesser known and more local colleagues. The Francis painting um, was also singled out um, in that otherwise rather scathing review in the Manchester Guardian that I uh, mentioned earlier, um, whose critic bemoaned English institutions for their failure to capitalize on its presence in the UK by acquiring the painting and other American abstract works for a British public collection. What are the chances, he wondered, of retaining this canvas in Britain? Have we a public body sufficiently alive to the situation of the art world today to buy such a work while the opportunity is open? It turned out not. And most of the American paintings were returned to the US when the exhibition's tour ended, though several of the British paintings were sold, including Cohen's Happy Day, which was purchased by Stuart Mason, Director of Education for Leicestershire, and is now in the collection of the University of Loughborough. And Mason's name is also included on the guest list if for the abstract impressionism opening. Abstract impressionism, um, Oh, sorry, here's, the, um, here's that quote uh, from the Manchester Guardian. Abstract Impressionism then provided a vehicle by which American, British and European art could be presented as somehow mutually legitimizing. It served a purpose for the two curators, Cohen as an artist whose work was singled out alongside that of his more famous peer, Sam Francis, and Alloway whose connections were reinforced in a manner that clearly benefited his career. The exhibition also served an institutional agenda, however, and might be read in the context of the university's cultural and institutional status and ambition. When abstract impressionism opened, showcasing, showcasing post-war abstraction to an East Midlands audience, it did so in a building that was itself relatively new, the Portland building on University Park campus, and here's a, a postcard of it, um, in taking the year that it opened in 1956. The Portland building on the first floor of which the gallery was located had opened in 1956 to mixed reviews, decried in uh, another student newspaper, The Gong. So we, have, we had uh, The Gong and The Gongster, which was a kind of response to The Gong. Um, it was decried um, as, quote, an unmitigated architectural disaster, a pompous Portland stone pile out of sympathy with its function and its environment. Its architectural shortcomings notwithstanding, um, the building signaled a deliberate strategic direction on the part of the university, whose vice chancellor Bertrand Hallward had returned from a tour of American university campuses inspired um, by uh, both uh, the kind of neoclassical architecture and by the notion of a single building that housed the various operations and resources necessary for the campus community. So a building in which uh, students could eat, study, debate, buy books, all under one roof. And he outlined this American inspiration at the opening of the Portland building um, in that quote that you can see here. In this context, we might read abstract impressionism as an albeit probably inadvertent champion of this cross-Atlantic inspiration, a display that shored up the model of the university as a place of international ambition in the East Midlands, 
one where the local was set in the context of and uplifted by an enthusiasm for all things American. So, and I realize I'm running out of time. Um, what does the example of abstract impressionism tell us? Um, first, I suppose that the reception and promotion of American art in the UK was happening well beyond the galleries of Mayfair and the exhibition halls of Tate institutionally, geographically, so the campus gallery in the East Midlands. It reminds us that the art world into which American art was brought in the post-war period by curators, artists, dealers, government agencies was complex and delineated by a network of relationships that couldn't always be easily distinguished as either metropolitan or regional, but that traversed those apparently antithetical positions. And ironically, it seems that, you know, Nottingham emerges as kind of one of, one of the um, uh, best places to showcase this kind of abstract painting um, in the late 1950s. The Nottingham University Gallery on the occasion of abstract impressionism, like the Midland Group Hannah in, um, Gallery in Hannah Neat's analysis, represents not merely the intersection of local, regional, national and international, but their inseparability, a feature that's really crucial for understanding those transatlantic curatorial exchanges. From our perspective as researchers, this project served um, as a, a kind of champion of the small scale and the local where student newspaper reviews are just as valuable as nationally recognized critical voices. It served as a reminder of the value of archives on our own doorstep. Um, John mentioned this yesterday and, and like John, I tend to always to look for my research to archives and institutions in the US, so often actually on the West Coast, so a really long way away. And to have my gaze directed much closer to home by virtue of this project and by virtue of the pandemic has been really valuable in thinking very carefully about what we might find if we look hard enough. The research has served as a reminder that archival materials are always at risk of being lost or forgotten or relegated to the bottom of that filing cabinet in the corner of the office next to the dinosaurs. So we must be attentive to their recovery and to their preservation. And it's a reminder that we should be appealing to our own institutions to be attentive also. Finally, since we're coming uh, towards the end of the day and our three papers this afternoon, we might uh, see the example of abstract impressionism as a helpful reminder that all university staff really want today as in 1958 is a decent cherry party. That's great Lucy thank you for that and I think um, if Emma and Ashley want to rejoin us I don't know if Mark wants to to join us also to for, for time for some questions um, if we have uh, there's, there's forthcoming if anyone would like to write in the chat I'll do my very best to um, voice uh, to, to, to communicate what it is that we're, we're interested in finding out about to the, the panel. Um, you may have questions for each other as well, so um, do feel free there. Hey, um, oh, we're waving. That's nice. I've got a question. Um, that, sorry, that was me putting my hand up. Oh, oh we. Um, yeah. <laughs> I we actually a, had a, we have a raised wave hand wave. function. Should anyone want? It? <laughs> oh, yeah, go do go for it, Lucy. Sure. Yeah, I um and thank you, Ashley and Emma, for such beautiful papers. I um. I actually had a question for you, Emma, about um, viewpoint and perspective um, in those kind of troubling and unpleasant images. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of, I was curious as to kind of where the position of the camera and, and the photographer is in those, where sometimes it feels like we're kind of looking down from above and mm. sometimes it feels like we're sort of part of that group holding hands at the table. And then that's kind of shifted and changed and something happens to that when we look through the stereoscope. And I, I just wondered really whether you could kind of say something about that, that kind of question of where we are as viewers of those images. And I suppose also as handlers of the images, because in using a stereoscope, the first thing we do is touch the image, right? To put it in the machine. And, and it feels like we have kind of a, a slightly different relationship with these sorts of photographs as maybe we do well, with the sorts of photographs that Ashley was talking about. Yeah, so thank you, that's really interesting. I have lots of thoughts. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is, so the photographer was 
never one of the circle holding hands, which I think is an interesting, mm -hmm. is, is really interesting as something to think about. Um, you know, someone who's not participating in the seance, but is sort of free moving. And that's why they weren't, there are other psychical laboratories. Um, Albert von Schrenk Notzing, who made the most famous, if you've seen an ectoplasm photo, it's probably of Eva Carrière by Schrenk Notzing. Um, he had them rigged in his laboratory, sort of in fixed positions, almost panopticon like. Um, whereas the Madri case, I think maybe because they kept changing the location of the laboratory, they'd instead have a sort of free moving photographer. Um, which is also interesting if you're thinking about the issue of fraud and potential fraud, you know, that like the one of the things I'm not sure if it came across in the talk or not, but is that the spirit guide Walter is the one who dictated when photographs could be taken. Um, so he would say, okay, you can take a photo now. And then Madhuri would sort of have to try hold this pose of the ectoplasm while the photographer moved. Um, in terms of actually handling the images. So the last time I went, Senate House didn't have a stereoscopic viewer. So I haven't actually seen, I've seen other stereoscopic images, but I haven't seen these ones as they're supposed to be viewed. And it's actually something I'm still trying to think about is how I'm gonna get around that. Um, but yeah, I think the question of viewpoint and perspective is really interesting. I mean, there's a gendered thing going on there too. That's quite obvious that I didn't have any time to get into, but you know, about, well, yeah, the role of Marjorie in this. What's interesting is unlike a lot of the other women I've worked on, um, there are letters from her. She does have a small archive of her own, but not in the Harry Price archives in other um, places. Uh, and yeah, and she's also sort of relegated to the background by the effects of the stereoscope, which pushed the ectoplasm forward, and by the scientific focus on the ecto You know, they're not interested in much, they're interested in the ectoplasm. Um, yeah. Perhaps while we're, we're talking about Marjorie and ectoplasm, um, David has a, a question in the, in the chat as well. Um, Emma, it seems extraordinary that hundreds of hours of investigation end up failing to resolve questions of reality. Do you have a sense of why it was so difficult for investigation to achieve this? And I think that's a, a sceptical question, isn't it? And we might um, recognise we've got Michael Leisure listening in as well and thinking about that idea of kind of sceptical looking. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> where, where was scepticism in, in, in this process? So... I might start this by saying that one of the things that recent a recent shift or recent scholarship on occultism tries to do is extend um, generosity and benefit of the doubt towards the spiritualists as well as the scientists, because most of the literature from the 20th century, sort of the 80s, 90s, is really sneering um, and starts from this position of it's obviously fraud. So what was going on? And we've sort of learned that you get to much more interesting places if you're not starting from that position. But in terms of the me mechanics of why they never um, concluded anything definitively, my there's actually a really good book on this coming out um, called Psychic Investigators, which deals with these questions of um, testimony. It's almost very legal. Um, you know, it's a case of who do you trust? and whose opinions are given different ways at different times. And race plays into this. I mean, Houdini is constantly denigrated for being a Jew and for being an immigrant um, and his opinions devalued because of that expertise plays into it. The fact that this person's from Harvard means their opinion counts more than this person who's just an editor at Scientific America. Um, but then it also comes from the fact that, and this is what the book I'm talking about um, that's coming out this year is interesting on is um, you know, what you count as proof, what you count as definitive is an entirely um, fabricated thing, right? I mean, that's what history of science tells us, that ideas of what proof is and when something can be considered definitive is invented. And so that's one of the things I'm interested in is how does psychical research draw those boundaries? And the answer is it doesn't, that you end up having these splinter groups. You have the psychologists who see it as, you know, um, uh, pathology in the brain, you know, double personality. Then you have the spiritualists who are convinced that it's actually spirit. 
Then you have physicians who are sort of in between who think it's real, but not spirit and somehow connected to the mental. I don't know if that answers the question, but I guess it's just that there were a lot of different agendas at stake. Also a lot of pride. So once someone had said they believed it, mm. if they were later unconvinced, it was embarrassing to walk that back. And no one ever caught her, you know, I guess, sorry, to answer it on a more practical level, no one ever caught her with her hand in her pocket, you know, or whatever. And Houdini said that um, she was one of the greatest conjurers he'd ever witnessed. Houdini was a very anti, did not believe at all. That methodology, uh, methodological explanation really helps me. I remember going, last time I went to CAA, I went to a paper that was about uh, a medium given without any sense that this wasn't definitely happening, uh, which I, I now understand more what I was I was listening to there. That's great. And just would stay, stay with them for a moment. Um, I think it's a comment rather than a, um, a, a question. Um, you know, from, from Michael Leisure, the value of the stereo photo is such a shallow space. It, the value of the stereo photo in such a shallow space is curious. The ectoplasm sometimes projects forward as if floating. And the note that you can view stereoscopes in 3D without um, a viewer, an easy trick to learn. And I get clarification from David as well that he wasn't being skeptical. I've imposed yeah. that. I'm sorry. I'll back away from that one. Um, Wonderful. Um, I think we have a question from the audience, um, and there's, there's another comment to come back to there as well. I think um, Natalie Adamson has a question, and I think we can unmute her in order to hear that. So let, let's go to that now, perhaps. Okay, thanks. Um, John, can you hear me okay? We can, um, yes. Thank you. Hey. Great. Um, I guess I've got a just sort of a corollary comment for Lucy, and then a sort of a a question um, or comment for Ashley and Mark. Um, three great papers, it was really interesting to hear them. And for, for Lucy, obviously, Lucy, we've talked a little about San Francis and abstract Im impressionism. And um, before you put up the comment at the end from AC Souter at the Manchester Guardian, um, I guess I was thinking it was him and the, a corollary example of all of the points you raised with your talk about the frailty of institutional record keeping and then the larger question of how and by whom sort of American art and abstract expressionism was positioned in the UK is um, a show and perhaps um, people might know more about it than I succeeded in finding out, which was recent abstract painting in 1956 at the Manchester University Arts Festival. Mm. Um, it was uh, installed in the Whitworth Art Gallery um, in December 56 and AC Souter was um, not the curator, but he gave lectures associated with it. Um, Paul A. Chu was the curator. And when I tried to get information from both the Whitworth and um, also then from University of Manchester Special Collections to, to try to track this show, which included San Francis, Rhea Powell, Rothko, you know, Pierre Soulage, Pollock, Heron, Sandra Blow and, and others, a, a long list. It, the record is, there's a slim pamphlet catalogue and that that was all I came up with. And so your talk on, on you know, the, the issue of, yeah. of archives here and then of reconstructing all of those pathways by which we can see to then regional geographies and campus galleries as, as Tigna said as nodal, nodal points is really um, taken. And I, if, if anything ever emerges <laughs> on this Manchester show, it's become this kind of you know, point of, of slight obsession for me. Um, yeah, I can understand that. Thank you so much, Natalie. And I saw that you were here, which is really brilliant. Um, because actually, I think your your work on San Francis is is one of the very few places that I've sort of seen mention of abstract impressionism. But that Manchester show seems like a pretty good reason why Suter had such a kind of cynical response to Alloway's framing. Mm. I mean, also the framing is. Um, uh, not the most convincing thing, I think. But what always strikes me is how difficult it is often with these exhibitions that seem like they should be recent enough that there is much more documentation to them. And, you know, we got so excited. 
and we found this one slide installation photograph but that's it that's we found no other photographs of of the installation although there are slides of all of the works that were in the exhibition again in the in the university slide library kind of you know mixed in the various different um uh kind of country based geographical designated drawers um but that's really interesting and it would be it would be so kind of fascinating to see to sort of know because there's it seems like there are so many of the same artists not all exactly the same but but lots of the same names that are coming up and it would be really interesting to know you know is that the same paintings that you know gimple fees are kind of hawking about and and sort of putting in in different regional locations is that you know how how is that happening and it, it seems to be happening in these much smaller often university connected regional galleries before some of those bigger kind of Tate exhibitions actually that this does it sort of feels quite early um and yet it is it, you know it's so kind of frustrating and it has been such a, a kind of an ongoing labor of of nagging and bugging colleagues and sort of heading off across campus and onto different campuses to try and find this material that is there's no systematic archiving of it um which feels so really deeply frustrating as, as someone who works at, at the university, but I feel like you need to get someone at Manchester kind of set them on the, on that same, because these things do bug you, don't they? Um, and I must say, you know, um, I, I mentioned Kat's amazing research at the beginning, but, you know, we, we were really not aware of this exhibition, you know, as Nottingham staff, and I'm ashamed to say as someone who's written about Lawrence Alloway, it was not on my radar at all. And it was when Kat was doing some research on the Francis um, painting that's at Tate, that she kind of drew this to our attention and it's just not part of the university's kind of narrative and history um, at all or not part of the history that it tells I should say. Mm. Yeah well to be continued. Um, if I can if I can come Ashley and Mar I see Mark is um, here too. I really enjoyed um, that presentation on the question of the photo book um, and the difference between the artist's book and the photo book and I wondered Actually, you said sort of at the end, um, quite a tantalising point about the correct way um, to display. And so I was just thinking about or wondering about what you meant by that. But just that you, you use the example of the Tate and everything that you were saying about the way that photo books are positioned or the way they get lost between different categories. Um, relates to my experience within it with a university collection of working to bring um, photo books into um, the University of St Andrews um, and finding them then being kind of lost between rare books which sort of doesn't want to have anything to do with them because there's too many pictures and they're quite contemporary um, and maybe don't seem rare enough um, and things like that. I don't mean to be um, too harsh about colleagues who've, who've also worked extremely hard, um, but they, they get lost in the ta taxonomic sort of designation. So we didn't have the library had to go through this kind of incredible process to create a photo book category. And then there's still ongoing sort of debate about where to situate the these items, whether they should become museum items, whether they are in fact artist books, as, you, as you've discussed, and, and where the frontier is. And in all of that, my final sort of thing is that I've seen sort of certain kinds of photo books just get then lost and have started to reflect on why they've been lost in photo book histories and, and other histories. And, and an example of that would be Barbara Morgan's 1951 um, book, um, Summer, Summer's Children, where Morgan took the photos um, design, did the text and designed the entire layout um, of the book. Um, and then, of course, as a, a woman um, artist and designer and photographer is, is kind of lost to the picture, as she's seen largely as the, as the kind of companion um, to her husband. And she did this project kind of, you know, in her own time. Um, and so that this ta these taxonomic problems then lead to the very basic problem of, of invisibility as well for certain kinds of things, whether by gender or geography or race and that, that things get marginalized. Um, but to come back to it, what the correct way, like where, where do we go with these? with these objects. Um, 
within these collections, I guess, is that something that your project is pursuing? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose it's because I'm a curator, I'm, I'm always interested in display and the like my pet peeve is like exhibitions of books and cases. Mm. I'm just like audiences. Why I don't? Why would I travel to London to look at a book that I can't flick through? Like it really. I just like audiences hate it as well. But then like, yeah, it's really complicated because artist books. When I see those artist books, are treated like sculptures, so you have to put them in a case. But actually, every artist I've ever met says they want you to look through the book because it's all about the sequencing and like it being a physical object. So yeah, I think. And recently I've been working on a project to digitise some historic books so the audience can flick through digitally, but that's not great either. So I'm kind of, I think my interest in copyright is to explore, to be able to explore ways out of this basically. So a lot of the reason we treat artist books like that is because we're scared of damaging them and we have to treat them like an artwork. And I'm kind of saying, well, if we get rid of this idea of the original object and things are reproducible, going forward can we actually allow people to touch them so I suppose that's why um the research went to kind of Mishka and John Hennig is Mishka's books are really interesting because they're completely open source and they're not auditioned so you can just download them so they're these kind of artist books that can function and we can just have them out with audiences um so I haven't answered your question at all I don't <laughs> think I suppose I'm considering how you display them in the way that the artist intended while still being able to protect them and actually if things like copyright and policy are stopping us doing that and actually that opens up bigger questions like you know do we do we have to start questioning the whole idea of trying to keep something in perpetuity or trying to keep it perfect if it completely stops the object functioning in the way it should um so i suppose maybe a different example would be like a i saw an exhibition of calder recently and none of the mobiles were allowed to move because the conservators had stopped them moving and you're like, and it feels like, you know, and it was like, what's the point in going? And we're kind of doing that with artist books, I feel. Um, and the other thing about how they're displayed properly is um, I was, suppose I was interested in the artists I spoke to all said that sequencing was really important. But then there was this kind of snobbishness around kind of like Thames and Hudson photo books where they were just like, oh, well, they're like really high profile and budget. And they were seen more as kind of artifacts of a career as opposed to things that were curated and I was like well I think actually just because something has a lot of money spent on it doesn't mean it's not sequenced in the same way and it has the same amount of care put into it just because something else is handmade so actually why are we making this really weird distinction between them and it, it comes back to this kind of like ickiness in the art world around the original object and if there's too many of something we don't want to think about it as art because it's a multiple and there's lots of yeah lots of things we're considering the research I think I don't know if you want to answer that any better but... no, no, no. <laughs> no Natalie I think that's a it's a really great point and I think it does raise the question about how unsuitable photography find well how unsuitable it is to sometimes to the art historical kind of the formulas that it wants to, to apply to objects as Ash just said about the uniqueness and um there's a great kind of um uh, interview well a kind of conversation between four or five people in the print collector's newsletter of 1973 it's like Peter Bunnell from MoMA and Aaron Siskin and they're talking exactly about this issue of the art market wants things to be unique and so there's talk about well the only way that a photographer should a photographer's work could become unique will be to destroy the negatives which might relate to something to Emma's thing actually which I wanted to kind of raise a little bit you know, so the, to maintain, to make the photography world, you know, applicable to these museological, museum-based and art market-based things about uniqueness of the objects and guaranteeing to the collector and the museum that that's the only one, um, then you get into this act of like willfully destroying the root of the photographic project. And the photographic book as well has always been a, it's, if you think about the, the way in which the library system works, most library books that are based around photography are still have a technical Dewey Decimal system. They end up in the technical section. They don't often end up in the art section. And you get this really confusing thing in the library about what is a book about art photography and what is a book about technical photography. And that's never been ironed out. So I think these problems exist in the background, which cause uh, lots of these, these issues as well. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's on a similar, I can't, I can't, I can't speak. Um, 
it's hard to assimilate them into this particular system. It's like they're a, they're to the side of the system that's grown up around what we think of as art and photography doesn't just neatly drop into it. I think that's the, yeah. the big issue. I think the point about visibility is really interesting. So a work at the moment, we're actually, we've just merged and we're combining two databases from two different museums. And we had to have this like slightly prickly discussion the other day where we were going through all of the different taxonomies and we had photography that was social history and photography that was fine art and photography that was photo photography of bits of the collection. And we had some uh, great Linda Benedict Jones photographs, who's an American photographer of Sheffield. And we're like, well, how, how do we place them? Because they're photographs of the social life of Sheffield. So theoretically, they're like perfect social history, but also she's a represented by a gallery, so she's an artist. And depending on where we put them, they will have completely different importance. And they'll have even be looked after in a slightly different way and displayed in a different way and catalog. And you're like, so even within the databases, there are these kind of visibility issues and issues of how photography works there. Yeah. Um, just to note, I think we've, we've, we've strayed slightly from the loose time uh, to schedule or schedule uh, timings that I, I mentioned at the start, but I think we can absorb that and take another couple of minutes because the, the, the conversation just seems um, really good to, to continue with. Um, I just wanted to, to raise something which I think has been touched on already. Um, Martina Majewska in the chat earlier on actually, um, also writing from St Andrews, um, just made the observation about um, the university's uh, collection of Richer photo books, uh, which are available by appointment to researchers and students, staffs from special collections are present so no one can damage the books, but you can you can browse them. Um, and I'm thinking about that kind of, you know, the space of the reading room or the print room. So at you know, University of Birmingham, similarly, you, you can book up to, to see any of the print collection and under kind of supervised conditions, which, you know, are ways in which galleries me, or museums kind of mediate between space that's not quite you know the main exhibition room or or, or, or circumstance but isn't quite the archive either um, and I wondered if we might talk a little about the, the kind of question of communicating and displaying some of the kinds of work that we've all been talking about either that sense of how to um, convey or how, how we might convey that idea of the kind of the depth of the archive that you, and scale of the archive that you described Emma at the outset or the kind of question of how museums and galleries spaces might kind of um, present the, the, the some of the back the backstory the kind of inner workings and institutional frames that um, Lucy Mark and, and um, Ashley have obviously been thinking about you know is, is that do, do we see that as, as being important to, to, to have that more overtly displayed and, and explained to to, to visitors, um, to people interested in looking at art, to understand the institutional context in which it's located. Um, is that something we're, we're sort of pushing for, towards? I don't know. I think I've, I'm always struck by how artists seem to have a better response to this or more thoughtful response to this than institutions. It's made, and maybe it's because they're not coming with the institutional baggage. But um, two recent instances I was thinking of one was um, the contemporary artist Gala Paris Kim, who had a show at Gasworks, and it was intervening into the British Museum's collection of human remains. And she created these sorts of series of interventions, along with letters written to the institution, about how they might find creative responses for, you know, for instance, caring for the spiritual as well as the physical afterlives of these bodies, which I think sort of links back to conservation. Um, but in relation to my materials, um, Alex Kowalski and Kit Price, um, who are researchers, and um, I think Alex is also a performer um, associated with Queen Mary, I think, um, made a really interesting intervention into the Senate House Psychical Archives by having this interactive, um, I guess, exhibit, which included some objects from the archives, but also audio recordings that they acted out of the seances. Um, there was a little performance included with each one. They made an app where you could go around and hear recordings of Christ while you looked at some of the technologies of the seance room. So I think that sort of being more creative with how we approach these things, I mean, has to be the solution, right? I think in the, in the context of 
of exhibition histories and this sort of um, invisible history that sits behind works of art, there is a kind of problematic tension between, between showing works, you know, paintings in a gallery and showing archival materials that often sort of operate as a surrogate or a stand-in for that exhibition history. So we, you know, we will kind of go into galleries and we might see, I mean, so the sorts of things actually that I've been showing on these slides that, you know, the exhibition announcement or the invitation or the cover of the catalogue or the installation photograph becomes a kind of surrogate for that that kind of moment, that temporary thing that occurred in the life of this work of art. And I'm a, I'm a really big fan of archival materials in the space of an exhibition. I think it's it, it sort of invigorates those histories, but there's also a way in which it kind of, um, we conflate those materials with the exhibition itself. And we're forever trying to kind of perform this act of reconstitution and recorporealization. Um, you know, the, the, when we go into archives, I think we, we are sort of aware that we can't reconstitute a person and an artist necessarily, but we're still trying to kind of reconstitute this temporary thing. And, you know, it, it sort of relates, I, I think, to, you know, really interesting in literature on, on documents of performance and other kinds of temporal event um, that we're forever trying to kind of put this thing back together. But I mean, as, as Natalie was saying, it's so frustrating that we can't. And then, you know, what what what's the kind of end point to that? Because we'll always have these gaps and we have this one installation photograph <laughs> and we just sort of, you know, we want more. And so we always show these fragments. Um, I'm not really sure what the answer is, but I think that tension is quite interesting um, that and, and what we're sort of trying to do for these exhibitions that actually is always going to be a kind of futile. I think re Sorry. regardless of the futility, Lucy, of maybe <laughs> that process. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> I think it goes before. I mean, I think John, your the question is a great one. I mean, what, what function does this material serve within the space of an exhibition? You know, mm -hmm. and I think Emma's point is a great one. There are ways in which we can creatively utilize materials to kind of enhance the you know the experience of uh, the knowledge of. But I guess what's dawned on, I guess, Lucy and I and Ash and Kat as well, working on these projects, is that if an institution hasn't collected the things that it should have, or it has and then it's lost them, or it's it's thrown them away, or it just doesn't know. Um, uh, David in the, in the comments has written something about it, and kind of an institutional forgetting. We do have these moments where regimes change and, you know, different things matter more to a university, for example, in this instance, and things are moved and lost. And I think what's come, what's been important for us has been this idea that, you know, why are we dealing with one slide of, a, of an exhibit? Why is that? Why is, why is somebody in an office who's not connected to this material anymore have this stuff hidden away and they have no idea really that it's there or its significance? And equally, and I know this is being recorded, why is it that when you speak to senior people in the institution and they say, oh, yes, this is a really, oh, my God, yeah, this is really important. And then that's the end of that conversation. You know, so how do you, because, you know, it's one of those things, well, do, why don't you guys do it then? And it's not about, is it? I mean, there's, there needs to be more than that. And the point I made to David was that the University of Nottingham has managed to keep intact a blackboard on which Einstein wrote something in about 1918 or something and that's still in that's perfect it's been kept. <laughs> no one no one could go anywhere near it um yet all of this other really important stuff I mean you know the, the example of Manchester Nottingham you know as we discovered you know one of the first exhibitions that Bridget Riley ever had was at Nottingham and there were there were Francis Bacon exhibitions from very early in his career and there's absolutely nothing about it um and that seems to me a travesty and a crime. So one of the things about this project, maybe it, we can use it as leverage to, to remind people of how important these, these things are. I'll stop ranting now. Oh, it was, it was good. It was good, Mark. It's, it's good to have that. Um, we did say we'd, we'd, we'd take a break. And I'm, um, I wonder if it, it's going to be, hopefully it won't be one of those things, because what we're going to do is, um, perhaps if we take 15 minutes and we could all be back on Zoom by and audience and, and, and participants be back by, oh, um, David's at 5.10. Let's go for, okay, it's a 20 minute break. We'll take a 20 minute break. Um, 
then let's do that. And hopefully what won't happen is what always happens if I do a two hour seminar in, in the university, everyone's talking away. I say 10 minute break, which used to mean people go outside and smoke cigarettes. Now they just look at social media and then we come back after 10 minutes and no one speaks again. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've killed it. So let's not do that. Let's take 20 minutes to, um, to freshen up and we'll, we'll meet again for a round table that might kind of look across you know, the issues that have come out of this panel out of uh, Michael's um, contribution yesterday, which I think uh, we might want to, to, to come back to further and, and, and to the first panel um, from yesterday as well. So back at 5.10. Um, super. So welcome back, everybody. I hope refreshed and uh, ready for uh, another 45 or so minutes of, of talk about this. Thanks so much to everybody who's spoken um, and uh, made it such a, a stimulating couple of days. Um, my name's uh, David Peters Corbett and I am, I work in the, the um, Center for American Art here at the Courtauld. Um, I've been listening with interest to um, what's been said by everybody and there's so much of it actually that it's actually quite difficult to select um, but I do have a, um, a range of things about six things that I would want us to to return to um, and among those things are from uh, yesterday self self-documentation that's a, a phrase by by Karen I think armoring yourself against erasure, she said at one point, very stimulatingly. Um, personal relationship one has with an archive. That was from Emma. Um, Michael's very stimulating uh, uh, plenary uh, paper about the, the nature of anthology making and it, its, active, its active role, um, the risk or frequency of exclusion in that process um, and what it might mean to um, recover from the archive things, objects um, and documents to set against an inherited exclusionary account of US art or any art really. And Lucy spoke at the beginning of her paper about scale fragmentation, the materiality of the archive as commonalities. And I think those things are, are there as well. Um, the objecthood of the archive, I think, which Michael also spoke about, uh, interestingly, in the context of discussion of the way in which um, the media, uh, the medium in which um, documentation happens and in where, how it's passed down to us is often a central element in the meaning um, of what we might gather from it. Um, a, me a central element that, that's often neglected or um, evaded in some way because essentially the, the, uh, the medium in which anthologies are produced or in which we tend to deal with documentation from the past is um, the plain, new, often neutral, uh, hygienized one of print, or even more so in some ways, the text on a screen. Um, and so much that's actually to do with the physicality of the archive is left out in that process. I think that was, that was immensely interesting. Um, and Michael spoke directly about his quote, the physical experience of using archives. And I just, in an effort to um, perhaps make sure we don't fall into the trap that John left me with, which is one in which we come back from the, the, the break, not willing to say anything else ever again. Um, I wonder if I could just ask you first to, to think about um, the physical experience of using archives. Um, and I'm just reminded actually, when people were talking about this, as, as in one way or another, actually almost all of you have done, um, of uh, the historian Carolyn Steedman's book from 2001 called Dust. Steedman is a, a very interesting um, is a social historian of mid 20th century Britain, a history, a history out of which she herself arises 
and she's extremely illuminating about the relationship between the personal, the formation of the historian herself, and the context in which she comes. But in this 2001 book called Dust, she opens with an extended anecdote, which is about visiting, um, I think it is the, the National Archives at Kew. And she goes to Kew and spends all day there, a familiar story this, right? She's come down from somewhere in the Midlands and is um, staying in London overnight in some grotty, you know, this is also the most familiar type of um, art historical or historical experience of visiting an archive, staying somewhere that you really don't want to stay, right? In her description, she, I imagine a sort of 1970s British hell of candle wick and, and damp nylon sheets from the way she describes it. Um, and then she goes to Kew, she spends all day, the sun's outside, the sun is shining outside, and she's, she's in with these documents all day. They bring them out to her. She opens one lot and she says, you know, a, 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 a puff ball of dust and dirt and filth arises from this document and envelops her so that all of her membranes are exposed to this. And then after a day's work, she goes back to this B&B &B or whatever it might be. And on the train back, she feels ill. And when she's in bed, she's suffocated. It's toxic. She's unwell. She has a dreadful night. She's coughing. The, the, the weight of the dust of the past is on her pressing down upon her. And that experience of the archive is suffocating, is toxic, is dangerous even, requiring a health warning physically and psychically, I think, is an interesting place to start with uh, the physical experience of using archives. Um, such activities come with some peril. Um, and also, as again, many of you have said, the physical difficulties, actually the impediments of using archives. Senate House doesn't have a stereoscopic viewer. The question of access, John said, dispersal and neglect institutional questions of the sort that Ashley and, and Mark have raised. Um, all of these have their place there. So I, I'd be really interested in hearing you talk about, about the physicality of archives and the object hood of the archive and it, uh, archives, the archive and its materials. Yes, John. <laughs> you've no, no, <laughs> only because you you predicted the situation. <laughs> I think Michael and. And Ashley both have a, a hand raised, actually. Oh, sorry, in, I can't. No, in, I, yeah. Uh, so in the Zoom uh, style. Can we go to Michael and then and then Ashley? Oh, great. Uh, that was that was so interesting, David. It made me think about the, the vast range of options out there for working in archives, because at the opposite end of the spectrum are the anodyne places where everything is immaculate and you have to put on gloves and goggles and you feel like you can't really get that close to the material because it's it's so it's so um, protected. Um, you know, in, in a way, I like the experience of the of the the less well organized, the dusty place where it just feels like your you know your contact with the material is closer, and the uh, you know the residue of its history is is so much more so much more vivid. Hmm. Ashley? Um, yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to say, my, my time in archives is quite interesting because I have my own archive at work. So I hate visiting other archives because I'm told what to do, whereas at work I can just go grab whatever I want. <laughs> so my relationship at work is far more physical. Um, but I suppose I was considering one of the discussions we're having a lot of the moment at work is about how you make archives available digitally or online so uh, so they're more accessible and actually we're having this discussion around not getting rid of the good for the perfect so in the past loads of stuff hasn't been accessible because it's not been photographed because we couldn't afford to have it photographed perfectly and we're now coming to a position where we're just like actually phones are good enough mm. but what we should really be doing is just photographing everything not at like our 
art standards and just getting it all online so people know what's there then they can come and see the physical object because there's this weird thing where you know if, if things aren't available digitally people don't know that they're there and they won't come and visit so there's this kind of like digital step before the physical step which i think we need to kind of get our heads around as a sector as well john and then emma when well, i guess i was just reflecting on um <laughs> The, the kind of archival experience you have is sometimes, but always, I, I think certainly in the kind of the, the art world, it can it can tell you something about how valued the thing that you're interested in or pursuing is. Um, I was thinking about uh, I was looking, I wanted, I was looking at some um, at late Raphael Sawyer paintings, and I got taken to some guys like lock up in a uh, in Brooklyn, and they were just like. <laughs> there and you sort of pick them up and no one really minded and you know um I was just sort of free to to browse through what the kind of remnants of what had been a kind of mid-century art collection um you know or you know my some experiences of where I've worked to quite a lot on illustration where you know that there's a few big name illustrators who do have kind of a connection to institutions but lots of the time again you're kind of just sifting through a, a chunk of papers that have been put in a in, in a box somewhere and I do think that that's one of the things that's really different about physical archival research is that you're you kind of work you know I'm I'm not in MoMA now that kind of sense as against you know, that kind of question of the digital where you know uh, yeah you can do a better or a, a more or less high quality or how you can spend more or less on your digital interface but at some level that's one of those things that's very much being kind of flattened out I think in, in in digital encounters with archives, um, that sense of you know the, the value and relation to institutions of what you're looking at. Um, I sort of have two thoughts because I feel like two slightly different areas of discussion have opened up. The one was I was thinking about what Ashley was saying, where um, this time last year I had this. So I'm from South Africa. And the University of Cape Town had this intense fire because it's our dry season at this time of year. And the entire African archives were lost and like irreplaceable rare books and manuscripts because the university never had the money to digitize it. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely, I, I sort of take your point actually. And also actually in my own research, the best Marjorie stuff is in the American Society for Psychical Research Archives but there's something like $7 million in the red at the moment and not open uh, in New York. And you sort of, there's one person you can email and she doesn't check the email and maybe there's an off chance that you could end up in the archive and maybe not. Um, and it's impossible to plan for it. And I, I don't know, I think that's interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I also, it was a thought that I had from our closing panel discussion as well about the difference between um, how objects are displayed in the museum and sort of the archival stuff. And I think it relates to the personal and interesting way. Because the thought I had was, what if we were allowed to interact with the museum objects the way we are with the archive? You know, is that is that a possible way forward? Because that's one of the most special things about archival work, you know, is your, and what makes it different from a lot of other encounters in the museum is the fact that, okay, maybe it's mediated by white gloves or maybe it's mediated by an archivist, but you do get to hold those objects in your hands and it is very choose your own adventure in a way, you know, it's an inherently personalized personal interaction you're having. Mm. Karen. Sorry, I can't find the um, emoji hand, so I have to use my real hand instead. Um, I think I have quite a particular relationship to um, the translation between archives within people's homes that then end up in institutions or in the process of doing that. So I've been working with an artist since about 2014. Um, all her material was in her uh, very small flat. And so I've been working with her to collate and rationalise that material to then hopefully um, for its acquisition by tape or it's gifting to Tate as it will probably be in the end. Um, so there's something about, um, yeah, very resonant. I immediately thought about Karen Stevens' book because that the dust thing being something that's very particular to um, working with um, materials. Um, the artist is sort of in her seventies. So 
a lot of this stuff is a lot of this stuff is in motion in her house because she works with her with her archive all the time but a lot of it is also you know sort of sitting in shelves or sitting under beds and and so there's something very very different about that relationship once it moves um and maybe once it's catalogued certainly and so um while maybe in the UK we don't always have quite a, a sort of anodyne experience that you might have if you go to somewhere like the Getty where, where um, materials are very differently sort of laid out although you know obviously going to a reading room is, is a particular experience particularly post-Covid um, in terms of wearing gloves for example but um but I really yeah I have a very a very kind of material relationship with a lot of the archives that I've worked with um, curatorially but also from a research perspective um, and sometimes even when they're in the institution they haven't necessarily moved that far from where they might have been boxed um, in someone's home as well I think um, at Tate there's this big tin box um, of um, Gustav Metzger's work that's sort of been sitting you know, in the corner of the archive reading room for years and I'm, I'm always sort of like intrigued I really want to go and open it but um, I always feel a little bit too shy to go and do that um, so yeah sometimes there are those sort of um, the translation or the transition hasn't quite made that effect yet and it hasn't quite become institutionalized even though it might sit within the institution itself mm. I mean there's a point I, sorry there are hands but uh, there's a point at which um quite a lot of archival material actually uh, is waiting to be categorized, you know, and to be understood as archival material rather than the alternative, which might be rubbish that you can put into a skip, you know, and of course a lot of material goes onto the bonfire, into the skip, uh, into the dumpster, whatever it might be. Um, and it, there's that moment when when it, it can go either way, really. And it's almost as if there's, you know, it depends on who's looking at it at that moment, um, which is probably just as well, because actually if everything were preserved, then it, then it would be impossible to reconstitute the world, the world of history, if we actually had all of those documents, wouldn't that be a terrible, terrible thing? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a fine line between the bin and the archive and you know when push comes to shove I'm always like I'll just keep it you know we'll deal with it later <laughs> but maybe that's yeah that's my my kind of hoarding aspect no 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 it's, uh, it's, it's a early <laughs> instinct isn't it uh, Mark thanks David no um Karen's point reminded me of, of of an interesting thing which relates to the question, some of the questions that have come around um, dispersal and, you know, I think you've made it in the chat as well, David, you know, what what's thought of as important in the moment and what is retrospectively imagined to have been important. A few years ago, I was kind of lucky to 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 go to um, John Sarkowski's uh, John Sarkowski's daughter's flat where she had all of John's archive spread across her Fifth Avenue apartment floor uh, with <laughs> Diane Arbus prints under the settee and things like that. It was kind of crazy. But what was fascinating about that entire, that week that I spent going to her apartment and looking through this stuff was she was very well aware that this was important. And there was a sense that she knew that it was, she was negotiating with various people at Yale and where else. So there was a, that was interesting to me that she already knew that this was a really vital resource. But what was also fascinating was that MoMA, if you contacted MoMA, MoMA would tell you that they already had John Sharkovsky's archive. So there was almost like this idea of dueling archives. And I think that's quite interesting when we have this sense that there are in, individuals in particular who have had an impact across many different areas at different points and have left an archival trail and how we piece that archival trail together and that idea of the person owned or the institution which owns the definitive archive of an individual, in particular of individuals or artistic groups. So I think that's quite an interesting thing to bear in mind. And that's one of the things that's, I guess, dawned on me looking at or thinking about the impact of, the impact of um, archives of American art in the UK existing whilst exactly similar things obviously exist elsewhere as in in the United States as well and that 
those the relationships between those archives, I think, has been that's been come, that's something I've been thinking about quite a bit actually. Um, and whether whether Tate has four 26 gasoline stations and the Whitney will have 15 and really, you know, what does that mean in terms of this historical record and how we can kind of navigate and negotiate and, and use those archives to tell or make histories? I think that's what's been playing on my mind and especially more so when we've all been kind of similarly saying very similar things about the archive. So well, that does seem to pick up something that, that Michael was talking about, which I, I referred to just at the top of this, which is this, um, the way in which actually it, it, it's very easy for particular selections from the archive, from the documentary history to become institutionalized as the representative text, right? There's so somebody, I think John in conversation with Michael actually said something about the, the, the teachable archive, right? The teachable document. The what it, you know, those, those things to which appear in, in anthology after anthology, or um, which we are all familiar with, which we go to in teaching, and which have a, a sort of international presence because of that, and come to define, therefore, people's encounter with particular artists, um, or the way in which they come to understand them. And that seems to be related to, to what you're talking about, Mark, because like, you know, most human, well, like human institutions, there's inertia. It's quite a it's quite a strong dimension of the dynamic. Ashley, you, you had your hand up. Um, I think we you. can't hear you. Um, because listening to this as a museum's person, it's making me think of a couple of things. So actually, like we keep talking about the archive, but these things were in they're not archives. Archives is a specific legal thing where statutory documents have to be kept. So this is really just like stuff around paintings. Um, and actually there are policies of things that we do have to keep when we bring in an artwork, which are set internationally. So actually to change, you know, we keep talking about how the archives are really different and stuff's missing, but it's because we only have a statutory reason to keep certain bits of information and everything else just comes down to individual taste or want. Um, and also when you, we talk a lot about kind of exclusion and things being left out, and actually, I think often the museum or the curators are seen as the authors of these collections and they make the decisions over what enters these archives. But you know, we know that in most institutions, up to 90% of the things will be donated by collectors. So if the collectors don't have the information and they haven't kept the information, we're not going to get it. So actually, and I suppose a good example is archaeology. Archaeology has a very clear legal structure of which contextual information you have to keep when that object enters and it's far easier mm. to work in that archaeological archive because legally you have to keep that information but with artworks it's not you have to keep like possibly where it came from and who made it and like it was legal they bought it and that's pretty much the only information you have to prove so to improve archival work we really have to change the underlying policies to tell us what to keep if that makes sense what information has to be kept yeah, very clear sense and, and absolutely on the question michael yeah yeah um, I, i'm reminded of a, a wonderful point that lucy made in her paper about um our power as scholars to shape archives when lucy was collecting stuff that was scattered around and putting it into a, a place where it could be all held together I mean, I'm, I'm uh, aware of doing that myself. At the moment, I'm working on this project on the beginnings of mass visual culture in the US. And so much of the, of the really important material in that story is, is gone. It's all been discarded by libraries and museums. And it's just what, if there is a copy of a really important image now, it's only in one repository. And I've been able to buy on eBay some of the things that are really central to the to this study and i'm thinking you know i've so i've um, i've compiled this this stuff um that i've bought very inexpensively and i'd love to give it to an archive but then it will be subject to the categories of that archive and it will be split up so the point of the collecting will be lost it's it's it's, it's difficult yeah yeah <laughs> my dogs <laughs> just on that on that note i guess to kind of pick up on that that idea of our role as researchers and scholars um 
I, I keep kind of thinking about that idea of dust and and perhaps the attraction that we have to that that really tactile way of of working with archives and the opposite of that is a kind of hygiene that we encounter at places like the Getty Research Institute where it's all wonderfully air conditioned and everything you know there's no dust there which sort of feels a little disappointing um and I I, I was kind of thinking about the the day that Kat and I spent looking through that correspondence um that we had located and is on its way to special collections but we looked through it at a table in a cafe and that was quite a di quite a different research experience you know for somebody who's kind of more used to being at the GRI or at the Archives of American Art or e even frankly you know at um the British Library that actually this kind of real um informality was absolutely delightful and it, it was kind of a, a different experience than I know it will be going back to view that very same material probably in the same folders but in the university manuscripts and special collections and so I think you know that there's a kind of joyfulness to that that finding this thing that is still dusty um, that I suppose is sort of what, what you were saying John about the enjoyable kind of physical enjoyment of that. I mean, that's such an interesting set of points, actually. I I'm really want to know what, where that joyfulness springs from, actually. That actually what it is about, about you know, encountering the document in the wild that's, that's actually so much more exciting than encountering it in the suspension files or whatever, or, you know, the, the metal box or whatever. I mean, what, what, what gives it that quality? I think there's a tiny bit of kind of it almost felt like sort of being somewhere that we shouldn't <laughs> I think that that it sort of felt you know there was a sort of slight frisson of 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 that kind of actually that kind of danger actually of of you know we're sitting with these things that feel really important just institutionally historically you know important for the university as much as important for art history and exhibition history and yet we're just kind of in this cafe and there's no there's there's none of that sort of structure that that one would that is almost the safety net i suppose that kind of catches you <laughs> if you do something you shouldn't i don't know it's um yeah you, well you're the you're the decision maker at that moment mm -hmm. in a way aren't you i mean the the point is right is is you know as it were right sitting right on you that you can decide that those those objects are to be neglected at that moment and that's within also, your power. sorry david isn't it there is just also the joy of discovery and i mean there's something quite primal and i think sometimes whether it's actually and i don't know if i disagree with you a little bit i've still been sometimes really excited in the hygienic you know space of a of an official archive and finding the thing, you know, there's still, and maybe, maybe it's a childlike thing, but of like holding the thing that was written by the person whose work you've become to. So there are always that that tangible connection that you suddenly gain between. Well, it's an imagined tangible connection, I suppose, isn't it? Because so I just I think there's that there's that that materiality, that moment, and Ash's point about, you know, yeah, you can photograph all of this stuff on your phone and it can appear online, so people can read it. But will ever will that replace the, the act? Or will it will it encourage somebody to come and actually look at the real thing? And I suppose the question is, what do we get, or what do we feel happens by reading the real thing in its fleshy material quality, rather than just reading it on a screen? And I think that's that's interesting to me. Why why do why are we drawn to that original object in a sense, even if it's a copy? You know, how many times I've read letters which were being an old civil servant written on paper with about 18 pieces of gloss you know paper between where you made like multiple copies and they exist in ever vaguer more kind of like well they exist if that thing about them existing everywhere again there's still something about holding that rather than reading it just on a screen I think but I don't know there's something I don't know the hand gestures <laughs> you're gonna hate this I'm oh the archive I'm working on, I'm like actively photographing everything I touch, basically. So we have images of it because it, there's like eight thousand objects that we just don't know what what's there. Um, and I'm get I'm working with kind of hundred, like, you know, a lot of volunteers through the museum to actively transcribe everything as I'm photographing it. And it feels like 
I'm just completely taking all the romance out of it for you. I'm just because. <laughs> No. Go ahead. I was just going to say you can't take the romance away. That's the that's the thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm an old Benjaminian. That's what it is. Can I can I just move the maybe the discussion on a bit? And I should say actually what I should have said at the beginning actually, which is that yeah, if you if anybody listening wants to uh, add something or to ask the the group a question then then do um just let us know in the chat um and in fact carla kessler has done something like that that feeling of finding the dusty document is the intox is intoxicating and also dangerous i'm in the midst of trying to redact documentation that an art foundation has asked me not to use hmm. Uh, Ashley, do you want to do you want to speak to that? You put something in the chat. No, just um, I've been doing some research on the Tate on something, and because I work in the sector, and there's all these letters, and there are bits missing and bits redacted, and I can base I can work out what's going on because I know how the sector functions. Mm -hmm. So there are possibilities that if you bring in people with expertise in certain archives, they can that you can just kind of read through the redactions and know kind of know what's happening because you know the way that the system works that when things enter and when things leave and stuff so redactions can be a bit um but also in terms of redactions it's interesting in terms of now because of the european privacy laws we're being asked to take a lot of stuff out of our archives or to go through them and we're not allowed to keep a lot of uh, letters and emails for more than five years so the archives going forward are going to be in incredibly minimal and there'll be no personal information or letters or anything in them because legally lawyers are quite often, uh, scared of keeping them in a lot of institutions so maybe this is a good moment to, to turn to uh, a, a slightly different topic but which is i think raised by what ashley's just said um which is this question of self-documentation that that came up uh, yesterday. So um, I love that phrase, Karen, uh, in which speaking about self-documentation and Schneeman and so on, armoring yourself against erasure, you said, uh, the construction of the archive around the artist or around anybody really is an armoring of the self against erasure. That seems to be something that is really interesting to explore. In that context, uh, John talking about David Rogers um, and his, for whatever reason, lack of interest in self-documentation, -document unwillingness to generate it, unwillingness to amass it or to contribute it. Um, and also I think like, something coming really clearly out of your paper, Karen, which was, the actual process of historicization that archives record. And we've talked about just now, really, when we we're talking about that moment, that pivotal moment where actually somebody makes a decision about whether to include this or not, to abstract this, to take this out, to consider this redactable or not, to consider it potentially um, an invasion of privacy or not, all of those moments, right? The actual, are, are a present tense uh in which this these past documents um are actually being uh, gauged and given meaning for us right and by the historian but actually also by uh, the bureaucracy by administrators by many other by lawyers by many other people by litigants even possibly so um i'd be really interested in here maybe karen I, I, in hearing um about this, you know, your view your, more about self-documentation as a as a way in which archives get made around and by artists. Uh, thanks. Yeah, there's something I was just thinking when when Ashley was just saying about um, the production of archives now and, and their kind of potential difference or, or disjuncture between what we might have as um, sort of up to the point of pre pre digital culture or you know the pre-social media culture maybe um, and the advent of emails as our sort of primary route of um, correspondence um, 
and the alterations that that's obviously made to the ways in which we might capture and understand materials um, in a kind of physical archive. I mean, I, I still feel like there's a there is a massive um, discrepancy with how those things are approached. A lot of artists obviously print out um, emails that they feel are, are essential for preservation, with the you know the idea that that the paper copy is 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 infinitely more um, preservable and stable than a than a digital copy, which I think is probably true, um, particularly if you're looking at materials from um, more unstable eras, you know, before the sort of advent of TIFFs and JPEGs, where, you know, you're looking at different types of file formats that maybe are not readable uh, um, by a lot of machines now. And obviously, this goes back to like the history of, you know, film production and then digital film, you know, there's still issues around like the preservation of equipment to read materials as much as the actual materials themselves. And I think that's something that that kind of sits around a lot of this dialogue in some ways because um, methods of production are so related through the archive. And um, so when we, you know, we're predominantly talking about 20th century materials, you know, slides being in some respects, one of the more unstable <laughs> materials that, that an institution might have. And certainly we've heard a lot of stories in the last sort of 10 years of, of um, academic institutions getting rid of their slide collections because they see them as sort of moribund or, or sort of um, out of date. And obviously that's like the most horrific thing that you could ever say about any kind of media format. Um, slides are incredibly interesting and informative and they're built around certain taxonomies and you know, all those things. And so this kind of um, personal um, relationship to, to self-documentation, I think, is also something that occurs um, in in kind of correspondence to maybe to, to John's character. I mean, when you're looking at materials from the sort of 60s, 70s, no one ever puts a year on anything, you know. So the production of ephemera, for example, is 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 seen as something that is throwaway and is not necessarily seen as something that is worthy of um, capture by a lot of people, certainly. And, and the aims of that production for that particular item is certainly not with the intention of preservation, let's say. Um, so you have these kinds of moments where um, there's an ambivalence to the idea of capture at the time and also in the, in the sort of duration of the decades that, that go after. And it's only at a certain point that maybe there's a kind of rethinking or or an understanding that maybe that's the only way that this material is ever going to be understood because there's not necessarily been the production of a monograph, let's say, you know, with a lot of women's practices in the kind of dead zones of, of the, the sort of 80s and 90s, when a lot of women like Schneemann, who had an extremely long career, to use her as an example, um, where she's predominantly known for a lot of the work in the 1960s and 70s, but she's still practicing all the way through to the you know to to when she died um in the last couple of years there are periods where you know certain production formats become very particular because of um uh the degradation of materials that occurred because because work was made so cheaply let's say so i think there's something something about like the life cycle of certain types of forms that also attach themselves to maybe an ambivalence that is incorporated within this kind of idea of, of, um, of self-archiving. Um, and the attitude of John's uh, curator, I feel like, is quite symptomatic of that particular era in a lot of ways. And I think sometimes that's why institutions don't necessarily have a lot of material that relates to that era themselves. That doesn't really answer what you're saying though, sorry. <laughs> no, but uh, well, I, I, it's, it's a, direct response to it. I mean, it's interesting. Um, John, do you want to add anything from the point of view of, of what you've experienced looking at David Rogers? Um, I think how to, to frame that. Um, the, you know, what you would, I, I think what I ended up, you know, there was a sense of kind of, you know, using scraps and bits um, along the way. And what was either missing at points was um, was, was kind of explanation um, 
as to you know as, as to purposes or any, any kind of sense of, of intention um you know i think naively i was anticipating the more of the kind of uh, the, in the process of acquisition there'd need to be um a greater sense of, of, of explanation and justification that would would give us material to use and it's kind of and, and in some instances there was um you know the, the so yeah so i found with the obviously the, the james rosenquist um the lithograph that they acquire he it, there is a kind of a, a paragraph of explanation of, of why this was 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 useful and, and valuable and it may be that there was in a and that, you know that's the, the difficulty of the archive then <laughs> in other instances for the, the the warhol you've just got you know um you know a set of forms filled out without that that that, that kind of larger explanation and that doesn't mean that it wasn't it didn't happen and it, or it wasn't written but it just didn't happen to have been captured so it's kind of difficult to know you know and, and that's one of those things that you know archival research always in, in, entails isn't it is you don't know why what you're looking at is what you're looking at you don't know whether it it, it didn't exist you know what you're not seeing didn't exist or it's just not being captured or recorded um and that, well, Michael, you know, that's also Michael also, a bit interesting yeah I mean Michael also was talking I mean no, you don't yeah. believe it's John but I I mean Michael was also talking about about this in saying of you know works of art that of, of the documentation in the archive that it's not, you know, even it, even though we sometimes desperately want it to be, it's not a key, right? That it it, it doesn't somehow, it isn't the secret of the work, right? Or the secret of, of whatever topic or question that we're trying to investigate. It's just more to be interpreted. It's more information to be interpreted. Um, and that's inevitably the case that whether it's full of gaps or is extremely uh, fulsome, um, it it actually still needs the the you know us to be uh, to give it that sort of hermeneutic attention. Sorry, Mark. I was just if I could just very briefly, I mean, because we we've, we've talked a little bit quite a bit about digitization, which is obviously wonderful in all kinds of ways, and this is not to go. In, but you know, that, I think there is that sense as well as in the digital archives give a. a, a just the interface and the nature of it tends to give you that sense of completeness or it's much harder to see what you're not seeing um you know to, to understand where where selection has happened and 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 i think there is something different about you know seeing files and handling things that helps you to to navigate that in ways that kind of get lost maybe when when things are on on screen i don't know if others share that but sorry mark i didn't mean to, to no no off. i mean two, i mean two quick things really and that comes out of Karen's talk conversation then. Um, I, a while ago, was trying to get a British novelist from the East Midlands to talk about his archive. And he was really embarrassed when he said he didn't have one. So there was that idea that there's an expectation. And then working with some American photographers now who are in their 70s and 80s, who have steadfastly kept absolutely everything. And when I said I can't see everything what should I look at and they're like I've got no idea I've got no idea what I've saved so you have this idea of absolutely nothing or everything and obviously that idea that yeah then it's our job to make that to stitch that story together um I think what's fascinating though for me with the project that I'm working on now is that because I'm talking about a community of people it turns out most of these people are either married to each other or having affairs with each other and none of that is in the archive. And so <laughs> I've been told several times by people, don't you do know that she was married and all of that. That's the stuff that I want to find in the archive, but isn't there. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Ashley. Um, yeah, it was interesting what you're saying about not knowing how things become recessioned and come in, because it just made me think actually what well, historically when I look at the collection I work with, sometimes it's quite clear because it's just a letter it's letters between the dealer and the curator and that's how the decisions were made but now all of our decisions are made as groups and that whole curatorial team works together and quite often we're inviting other communities in to make those decisions with us but it actually means that through the decision making process becoming more diverse and inclusive the evidence disappears because we don't record those conversations so basically we all meet up in a room and then archivally you'll just get a yes or no come out of the end of that meeting if that makes sense ah um so it's it, yeah it's kind of a weird paradox but the more open the decision making becomes the evidence disappears because you're all in a room physically physically and those letters aren't happening kind of are the other participants in in such meetings recorded uh 
yeah to a degree they'll just be like a list of people and there'll be a list of what was put forward but then all the discussions are had and they're not recorded and then there's just like a yes or no list at the end so yeah. Yeah. whereas when it was two people you could just follow every single letter and like work out exactly how it happened sometimes so this is interesting you haven't got time to record these things michael uh, just a quick comment in response to Mark's um, Mark's words uh, and wanting to know about uh, marriages and things that are not in the, in the archive. You know, it's um, it's often um, very productive to cross archives, you know, and look in places where that kind of information would be kept that have nothing to do back actually with your subject, like, you know, the uh, ancestry or census or immigration, or there's all kinds of now digitized archives that are really easily available where you can find out where, who's living together and uh, how many children they have and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, uh, in some ways, it's harder to, to, uh, to, to shape our own archive, to, to, you know, to, to curate it than it used to be because of all of the, uh, all of the surveillance material that's now accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. I think I was being warned, Michael, again, saying things to certain people. That was what it was. If you're going to see somebody, don't mention this, that and the other. So when you were talking, Emma, um, in response to the questions about, um, you know, what, you know, the, the, the attempt to, to decide what was actually happening by the, your scientists, right? Um, you, you see, you, you talked about a duty of care to the archive actually when you're answering that question that you you know one would have to not be not approach the archive skeptically but uh, seek to understand what those people might actually have believed um and i i wonder if you think that's applicable in any way to the discussion that we that karen and and michael and ashley and and mark have just been having in particular that that you know there's um you, we constantly encounter this process in which of, of self-redaction as well as self-construction. Does that what bearing does the duty of care have on that? How does that work in relation to it? Yeah, I mean, I guess as as um, archive visitors as well as archivists, you know, I mean, I think the question of um, the duty of care is really interesting. I don't know if I have such profound thoughts about it at the end of the day um but it is something i think about a lot of, i mean a thing i didn't get into in my talk much is the madri case was actually very polemical there's text called the madri polemic in the archive that i was sort of trying to trace some of this so there's also like a self um recording and self archivization going on at the same time as other archives being collected but anyway um but yeah, I don't know. Do other people have thoughts about this? Yeah, I suppose um, we, with duty of care, I was interested in the project you were talking about with the human remains, because often we invite people to come in and research our archives or to work with us as artists. And like, there are different ethical standards for different parts of the archive. And I can't imagine us ever letting artists work with the human remains. Whereas mm. artworks, we encourage collaboration and work made around them and then like images from the social history collection where we know the constituent who gave them to us in our family history we'd probably be less likely to open up for creative interpretation than something where we didn't have that information so i think there's kind of a duty of care in terms of the ethics of how you use different archives and different pieces of information as well which is quite complex yeah or even um you know as i push i'm i'm a trained Victorianist, and as I push increasingly into the 20th century, having to deal with descendants for the first time. Oh, yeah. You know, Harry Price's great, great, <laughs> great niece or something is very involved with a lot of what I do and sort of the um, satellite projects I'm a part of. And apparently I'm going to try, I'm in a, from my previous postdoc, I'm going to Lilydale in July, which is the largest, I think, maybe in the world spiritualist community. Um, and I'll meet Marjorie's grand, great, great granddaughter. Or I don't know how many greats. And it's, I'm, it's for the first time having to grapple with the fact that what I say might be read by someone who actually cares and has a vested interest. And that in itself is really new and interesting to me. 
I mean, I, I assume that people who work on artists from the 70s have to deal with this a lot more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, there is, there is an ethics, there must be an ethics of the archive, you know, at what point does it become possible or an obligatory, in fact, on us as historians to, to recover things that the individuals would not have wished to have been recovered. Um, or their descendants or posterity do not wish to have recovered? How do we negotiate with those things? Um, I don't, you know, on the face of it, it's hard to see why, um, if you're dealing with, a, you know, somebody in the 16th century, your duty of care is any less than it is to somebody who died in 1980. Except that, that um, our total knowledge about those people is so much less and therefore anything needs to be recovered argumentatively, or possibly arguably. I think okay. there's also, oh, sorry, are we done? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I wanted to say, I think it makes me think of um, archival absences too, and what our duty is in, re in relation to those. Um, because sort of, I think I mentioned this in the Q and A of uh, maybe yesterday, but my PhD research was on an artist who doesn't have any archive at all. And I sort of suspect she destroyed it herself. Um, and what she was included in the queer British art show at Tate a few years ago with a kind of, in my opinion, slightly spurious claim that maybe she was queer because she was buried next to her nurse maid. And I was kind of offended at it and shocked by it because I know the archive such as it is well enough to know that that information does not exist and isn't there for us to make those claims and felt like it was doing a disservice to actual queer Victorian artists. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, what we do when we're interpreting with little evidence, as well as with what to do, you know, when we have a lot, I guess. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad you picked up on that because I'm gay and I went to that show and I was like, they were just kind of going, oh, this guy painted people topless a bit. Maybe he was, and you're like, it was really cringy. It was lots of really spurious claims. Yeah, it's good other people picked up on that as well. Thanks, everybody. I I am aware that we we've, we've gone past the the six o'clock watershed, and probably we should we should draw to a close. Um, thanks so much for talking. Lucy used used this this wonderful phrase. I I don't know if this is spontaneous, Lucy. It's extraordinarily eloquent. Um, in talking at the end, I think actually apparently spontaneously at the end of your paper, this invisible history that stands behind works of art. Right? That's a very uh, interesting way of, of putting it, partly because it, it slightly rejigs, I think, the relationship between the archive and the and the work and foregrounds it in ways that's, that actually is quite valuable because we haven't tended, I think, quite to articulate that. Um, otherwise, I think just before we go, um, does anybody have a view on, now we've come to the end of this, you know, the fruitfulness of UK collections for seekers of US archives? Yeah, I suppose um, one key idea that just came up is actually that British and British and American museums are set up differently. So we have a legal right to keep objects in perpetuity and our archives will speak to that and we can't, it's illegal to get rid of art objects from British museums. It's far easier in the US to sell works from collections. Mm -hmm. So their archives will be set without, it will be structured differently because they won't have this idea of that object being kept forever maybe. So there is a quite a key policy dis difference which might also feed into archives and make British archives function in a slightly different way. Interesting. Well, that speaks to earlier comments about I, Mark was it I, uh, about the the parallel nature or or finding materials in in more than one place across the Atlantic, Lucy. Yeah, I think um, certainly with the project that we were working on to do with abstract impressionism, but actually I think it's come out in other papers as well. I, I just kind of return to that question of scale and the the way that actually a lot of us were working maybe with less obvious archives and archival sources and, and types of stuff um, beyond you know the, the kind of more obvious larger collections that might be in the US and I think there is a huge value to that that we get a kind of slightly um, oblique angle at American art history 
both American art as it happened in Britain, but actually also as it happened in the States. And I think we get a, a kind of slightly different angle that is really valuable because we're looking at different sorts of materials or, or things at different scale. And, and we have different voices that then come through the archive. Um, it's also, it sort of made me slow down a bit and be a bit more attentive and not immediately jump to, to that kind of transatlantic research travel and, you know, that funding application to go to DC or to LA. I think it's, you know, th there is, a lot to be gained from kind of seeking out these these other things that are a bit closer to home. Hmm. Thank you. That's a great place to stop, I think. And, uh, John, do you want to, to say any la last words? Uh, just briefly. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the things that struck me is, you know, obviously the, the, we've worked on this project kind of has been run contiguously with the pandemic to some extent. Um, you know, the, the two things are, you know, have been connected and related in various ways. Um, we'd normally go be going for a drinks reception at this point, and that's a kind of an art history cliche, right? And it's become an art history cliche to mention this at the end of a Zoom call that we're not doing it. <laughs> and, you know, I think that not being able to do things has made us think about, you know, what is that indulgent when we did that? Or was it really important to have those other conversations and not have a kind of weird boundary between audience and panelists and just be able to talk to each other? Um, and I think that that's something that's true about the the, the event as, or the, the project as well. You know, on the one hand, we've maybe seen where, you know, I'm sure, I, like everyone else, you know, I've been reflecting on: you know, Do I need to get that flight? You know, how important is that for various on various levels? And you know, on the one hand, I think what we've affirmed is the importance of of archival research, and we've shown that you might not you might not always have to travel to do that if you're working on American art in from a in a, a British institutional context. So there's that side of it. But I think we've also kind of recognised where those elements of physicality, materiality, you know, do necessitate that tra you know, travel and movement and an exchange in those ways so you know hopefully we've questioned and affirmed drinks receptions and research trips <laughs> that would be a place to pause yeah. thanks john thanks everybody and we should i think with thanks everybody again um bring things to an end <laughs>